My focus of research has always been on the differences between women's brains and men's brains. How do women's brains age differently? Puberty, pregnancy and perimenopause. And what these three P's have in common is the brain rewires itself. And these changes have consequences for many women. Dr. Lisa Moscone is an associate professor of neuroscience and neurology and radiology at Weill Cornell Medicine and the director of the Women's Brain Initiative and the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Weill Cornell Medicine. Moscone was listed as one of the 17 most influential living female scientists by The Times. And she's also the New York Times bestselling author of The Female Brain and Brain Food. Let's dive into this conversation with the amazing Dr. Lisa Moscone. You're a neuroscientist. I you know, am. You're studying the brain. This is what you've done for Forever. so many years. Forever, <laughs> ever since I was a kid. Did yeah. I tell you? Yes, yes. You know, this is in your, it's in your DNA. It's, it's in your in, lineage. Yes, I think but it's But if you there. could start off, because I think we kind of know this, but we don't really understand. Mm. There are differences between the female brain and the male brain. Yes. Can you start off by talking a little bit about that? Yes, so I am a neuroscientist by training. However, I have a dual PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine. And nuclear medicine is a branch of radiology where we use um, imaging techniques to scan, in my case, the brain. So I'm a brain imager, in, you know, in the simplest possible terms. And my focus of research has always been on the differences between women's brains and men's brains, in part because of my family history. I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia on the planet, affecting over 6 million people in the United States alone. But what most people are not aware of is that there is a gender prevalence in Alzheimer's disease or a gender bias, if you will, where almost two thirds of all patients are women. Mm. And so when my grandmother developed dementia and then her two sisters developed dementia, my mom and I started freaking out a bit. And I had just started my PhD and I was asking, is it just me? Or is there an effect of being a woman on the risk of neurodegenerative disorders like dementia? And back then, people would say to me, well, you know, what happens is that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age, and women live longer than men. So unfortunately, at the end of the day, more women than men have Alzheimer's disease. But that never quite made sense to me mm -hmm. entirely, because the age gap is not that wide. The, the longevity gap isn't quite there. So in the United States, the difference is about four years. Women live on average, four years longer than men, not 10 or 20. But in countries like in Europe, like in the UK, the difference is only two years. And yet Alzheimer's disease and dementia is the number one cause of death for women and not for men. So the question was always, well, is there something else? Is there something more? So my entire career has been focused on understanding whether or not it does matter, being a woman matters, and how do we steer away from that path? And do we do it differently if you're a woman or a man, right? Because it's important for men too, but is there something specific that you should be doing as a woman that you wouldn't do as a man and the other way around to make sure that you don't get dementia? And so with my PhD, what we showed, and others showed is that we had it backwards. So Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age. It's a disease of midlife with symptoms that appear in old age. Mm. But it's a disease that starts with negative changes in the brain years or decades before the symptoms emerge or can be measured on clinical grounds. And so that completely changed the question to, well, what happens in midlife to women and not to men that could potentially explain the higher lifetime risk of dementia for women? And one thing that we have found is that menopause plays a really important role mm -hmm. in the Alzheimer's, the female Alzheimer's connection. Mm -hmm. And so that's what my research is focused on right now. How do women's brains age differently than men's brains? When does it start? It starts in midlife. Why? Because of hormonal changes, at least in part. 
and what else can we learn and what can we do to offset that risk? That was a long answer. Oh, no, this is fascinating <laughs> because there's this huge event that, yes. you know, it's, it's just staring us in our face as to why this could possibly be the reason behind mm -hmm. seeing higher prevalence in women. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you, you know, just had the audacity to like investigate this, to question it, because what we tend to do, unfortunately, is like go with the simplest thing instead of studying it, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, becomes standard. Like, oh, this is just why. Yes. And sometimes it's a blatantly obvious reason that is not being investigated. And for mm -hmm. me, menopause is just like, oh, wow, that, that makes complete sense. Right. And so can you actually share from your perspective mm -hmm. what menopause actually is? Yes. What are the changes that are happening and in yes. particular with the brain? Yes. And thank you for asking. So I think as a society, insofar as we have understood menopause at all, it's always been just half of what menopause is all about. Because if you ask people, what is menopause? Most people have a notion that at some point, women stop having a cycle, a reproductive cycle, and stop being fertile. And after that point, the ovaries close down shop, if you will, that's what people say. And the woman is no longer reproductive, right? But what's missing entirely is the connection between menopause and the brain. Because the vast majority of individuals I've spoken to, at least, have no idea that there is a system in the body they were born with, the neuroendocrine system, that connects the brain, the neurological part of your body, with your hormones or the endocrine system that ends up in the ovaries. And this system, it, we're born with the system, but effectively it gets activated during puberty then it gets reactivated every time a woman gets pregnant, and then it gets turned off with menopause. And the switching can cause some of the symptoms of menopause that most people are familiar with. So when women say that they're having half flashes, right? Most people are aware that there's half flashes happening to the menopause, may have heard about it. But when women say they're having half flashes and nice sweats and insomnia and depression and anxiety, most concerning, brain fog, memory lapses, panic attacks. There's a lot of things that can happen. Those are indeed symptoms of menopause. They have nothing to do with the ovaries. Those are neurological symptoms that start in the brain and are a reflection of the many ways that menopause changes a woman's brain, which we're just starting to really unravel. And I believe that our our brain imaging studies were the first to map out the transition to menopause, not from the neck down, but inside a woman's brain. And now we have hundreds of women in the study. So we're able to really see what happens physiologically and chemically and structurally as well inside the brain as women go through menopause. And I think the results are quite interested in that. We have provided at least some evidence the menopause is linked with changes to the brain structure, biochemistry, energetics, functionality, and connectivity. And these changes have consequences for many women. We're going to put up some images, yes, some of your images, you. by the way, mm -hmm. for everybody to see who's watching the video version of the show. Yeah. And if you could, can you share with us what is changing here from prior to menopause yeah. because you have pre and then you have a post menopause brain. And we also have a peri, which is the in-between mm -hmm. and it's usually worse than the pre or the post. I mean, for most women, that's the really tricky phase is the in-between. So let me show you. All right, so this is a type of brain scan that's called a PET scan, P-E-T or positron emission tomography, which is what I specialize in. And we use the tracer that's called fluorodeoxid glucose, which is literally glucose, a simple sugar, attached to a fluorinating compound, which is a light emitter. So when you inject the tracer, it goes up to your brain and behaves exactly the same way that glucose would. But at the same time, we're able to get this little 
X-rays, you know, these little gamma rays that come out of the brain and we can take pictures of the biodistribution inside the brain. So it's mm. kind of fascinating. But what this shows is really um, how much glucose has been taken up by the brain, because remember, the brain calls for nutrients. We can't push them in, right? So this is the amount of glucose that the brain wants and is able to convert into energy in the form of glycolysis and ATP which is the cellular energy currency of all cells. So what we're seeing here is a very active, energetically happy <laughs> brain, <laughs> where for those who can't see the image right now, um, I, I'm sure you've seen them before. So these are the pictures of the brain where some parts are red, yellow, green, and blue, right? Where red means very high energy levels and yellow is a little bit um, lower energy, but still very high, and green is kind of like baseline. And then blue is just the fluid inside the brain that you need to have for cushioning and nutrition and support. So it's, it's good that we have the blue, but we want to focus on the red. You want to have a lot of red in your brain. And this is a very healthy looking brain. The woman who, who holds this brain was 43 when we scanned her the first time and she was premenopausal. She had a regular menstrual cycle and she had no problems whatsoever. She's very happy with her life. And you can see that the top of the brain, the front of the brain is very red and is almost as red as the bottom, which is good. It's what you want. You want to sort of in invert a triangle shape. And then you want the brain to be isometabolic, which is, means that the left side is as bright as the right. It's kind of symmetrical. Very good looking brain beauty is symmetry beauty is symmetry sometimes and this is what happened to that same brain within a short amount of time just a, about nine years it's kind of getting greener and greener so the red is turning yellow and the yellow is turning green and the after menopause scan is overall much greener than the before menopause can it's kind of dissolving out almost and if you put them side by side i think it's quite visually striking mm -hmm. that if yeah, like this is the same brain but the brightness has changed for people that can't see the video version which i highly encourage you to pop over to youtube and mm -hmm. hang out with us in the studio but there is a substantial reduction in red area yeah. after menopause yeah throughout the brain right so that quantitatively is a 30% drop in brain energy levels overall. But you know, it, it's, you, you feel it. I think the point is that women can feel these changes. And this is one person, of course, but at this point we have hundreds. And this is average. So I'm not showing you the catchy image that is dramatic and whatnot. This is actually an average change. What that means is that some women don't show this kind of change. Some women show no changes in their brain, very subtle changes. But some women show more dramatic changes, which is when I think it's really important to offer counseling and talk about it and maybe do a little bit more investigating. As, as you know, I'm, I lead the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Wildcornet Medicine. So we have three units in the program. There's the Women's Brain Initiative, which is our observational um, longitudinal imaging study. But then we also have a clinical trials unit, which finally is now testing uh, preventative strategies for women mm -hmm. and for men separately. So we, we focus on sex-specific targets, molecular targets and interventions I'm very excited about. And I'll tell you more, hopefully, soon. But then we also have the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic when we really counsel uh, patients about Alzheimer's prevention. So this is something that we encourage some of our research participants to consider when they have severe symptoms or maybe the brain fog is so severe that they're concerned about an early onset of dementia or maybe they have a family history of dementia or an APOE4 genotype or some genetic risk factors and then we do both. We do the research and we do counseling in clinical practice to really take care of the people who work with us. Yeah. This is so fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. I you should come in for a brain scan. Done. Oh, good. Done. <laughs> um, you know, here's, here's the thing. Um, I don't think we realize just how prevalent 
you shared a little bit about this Alzheimer's is now. Oh, In the yes. United States, it's the sixth leading cause of death yes. currently. So yes. it's like inching its way into the top five yes. causes of death. And it's largely considered to be basically when the onset happens, there's nothing you can do about it. The treatments for mm -hmm. it are very minuscule, maybe slowing down the process, but mm -hmm. where the real work can be done, the results, and of course your work is showing is in prevention. Yes. Right. We want to avoid yes. getting into that place if at all possible and knowing, and I'm so grateful for this, this kind of triggering event, these changes that happen in the brain, mm -hmm. um, with menopause yeah. and with that being said can you share because also i don't think a lot of us unless they've been directly impacted by alzheimer's mm -hmm. with a family member yeah understand how is this a leading cause of death like what's going on there it's not like a cardiovascular event where you have a heart attack and die. you know it is interesting because alzheimer's disease does not kill you necessarily but it renders you so vulnerable to things like pneumonia and infections and cardiovascular disease that for many, many years, it wasn't even considered an actual cause of death. This just changed mm -hmm. in recent years and I'm very, very happy that it has been because it is eventually the root cause of death for many people, regardless of what the final event is, right? So it is Alzheimer's that leads to those outcomes and it's, it's, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a personal history of Alzheimer's disease. I don't know anyone who doesn't have a person in their life, whether a family member or a friend, who suffers or has suffered from, from dementia. It's, it's incredibly prevalent and common, and it's getting worse. We are an aging population, thank goodness, in many ways, right? Aging is a gift, but it's really important to think about prevention so that our cognitive lifespan matches our actual lifespan. And there are so many things that one can do to protect your brain as you go through life. And it's just a matter of understanding what these things are and then prioritizing accordingly. Because like you said, we don't have a lot of therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. We now have vaccines, you know, there's two that have been approved by the FDA that seem to be able to slow down progression. I would say I'd much rather not be in that situation. I'd rather not have Alzheimer's to start with. And that's really when prevention comes into play. And prevention starts as soon as you start thinking about it. There's no age mm -hmm. at which it's best to start thinking. It's the age is now, because the longer you engage in lifestyle practices and the longer you take care of your health, the bigger your cognitive reserve, right? Your brain reserve, which is your buffer against anything age-related that can impact your brain. You just mentioned that we are an aging population. Yeah. And um, obviously human longevity has been going up, uh, but in recent decades, of course, the trend is reversed just in the last yeah. couple of decades. Yeah. But we still Especially are living States. longer, in particular in the United States, as you said. Yes. But with being an aging population, there are other cultures around the world that have a long history of having people living, um, you know, even into their hundreds, right? So yeah. there's these kind of blue spots that are now mm -hmm. become popular, yes. uh, blue zones. But within many of these populations, the symptoms of menopause are not the same as here in the United States. Can Isn't you talk that a an bit interesting that? correlation? And they have also the lowest rates of dementia. Look at that. <laughs> yes, I find it really, so there are a few things that were very surprising to me when I started looking at menopause, because again, I'm a brain person and I never thought I would be talking about menopause until a research on Alzheimer's disease led me to the study of menopause. And then I, I had to do a really deep dive into the science of menopause and what had been published and what had not been. And the first thing I learned very quickly is that very little research has done in general, unless you look at um, ovarian function in menopause. But when it comes to brain health and menopause, we, we're not in great shape from a scientific perspective. There are more cultural studies that I found really interesting that 
I believe clarified at least for me that there is no universal experience of menopause, that menopause is as individual as it is significant for many women, and that not only the duration can vary greatly and the causes can vary greatly and the impact can vary greatly, but also the symptomatology, which is interesting because Western medicine typically reduces menopause to there's an issue with your ovaries mm. and it's an estrogen deficiency syndrome, which I hate the term so deeply. And I use it for research because it's correct. You know, from, from a medical perspective, that's, that's what you find in textbooks. But as a woman, I don't have deficiency. You know, it's something that happens physiologically mm that can be addressed if you choose to. That at least is my position. It's very controversial right now in this space. I hate that term. Anyway, <laughs> if menopause was only an estrogen deficiency thing, then the experience would be very similar for all women, which is not the case, right? So we know that the best known comparison to the Western version of menopause is in Asia. Like in Japan, like you mentioned before, in China, where especially in Japan, where women tend to report fewer symptoms and milder symptoms of menopause. And what's interesting is that they do not even have a word for menopause until recently. Wow. Yes, historically, in like a Japanese pop population, in Japanese culture, they use this word konenki. To, de to define menopause, which actually means renewed energy. Yes, isn't that much better than menopause, which means the end of your cycle? I find this so much more flattering as a term, but they also have fewer symptoms. And the same thing has been found in other cultures and other societies. They have one thing in common because they're all over the world. Some are in South America, some are in Asia, some are in other parts of the world. And what these cultures have in common is that, one, they don't fear menopause. And two, as women go through menopause, they actually gain in social status. They gain more freedom. They gain more respect. And therefore, menopause is almost something they look forward to in some ways, maybe not physiologically, but in many ways, it's something that is not scary, but actually brings some gifts. And that seems to be related to a much gentler experience of menopause where some women have really no symptoms and those who have symptoms more like, yeah, whatever, you know, just go on with my life. And I think it's interesting that it really shows a couple of things. Then lifestyle matters, culture matters, your expectations of something really matter, and your mindset probably plays a bigger role in determining your outcomes than we are led to believe by Western medicine for sure. So this is something I explore in the book as well. I want all women to have all the information they need to support themselves during menopause. And I really, really hope that we, we will all get to a point where we make our choices based on knowledge and with confidence rather than fear rather than I'm not taking hormones because somebody told me I may get cancer. You know, what is the reality of that? And if I don't want to take hormones, what are my options? What are the things that really matter? And so this is this is what we're doing today. Yeah. Thank you for, of course, for doing that. Of course, this is, you know, I, I love this so much and I appreciate your work. Um, you know, talking with you. You is... love women. You care about women. Obviously, your wife, you love your wife, but also <laughs> you are very gentle and very careful with women and women's health that you really care about those issues and i really appreciate it so much yeah it's it's my honor i wouldn't be here without <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but you know talking with you is 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 unique because our thoughts change our chemistry you yes know, influence Absolutely. what's in particular what's happening in our brain yes the neurotransmitters hormones it is a very powerful aspect of being human that isn't talked about enough. We yeah. kind of look at us so mechanistically, unfortunately, and that's just kind of what we've evolved to in in our modern medicine. Mm -hmm. And it has its place, obviously, but taking yeah. the mind out of this and understanding the power of your beliefs mm -hmm. and your as you're sharing our perception of menopause 
and it's much healthier in yes. all these other cultures. Yes. So I want to circle back and talk a little bit about mindset. Yes. But first, yeah. when you mentioned Japan, something jumped right out. Um, looking at in particular our metabolic health, the yes. differences mm -hmm. here in the United States. We're right now at over 40% obesity rate yeah. in our in our population, it's our adult population. And obviously this is affecting women significantly. In Japan, that number is around 5% mm -hmm. of the population. Could this be influencing of what's course. happening with the symptoms of menopause? Yes, of course. The symptoms tend to be more severe for women who are severely overweight or in the obesity range. You know, metabolic health includes a number of factors, as you talk about all the time, but their hormones are involved as well. And they work in balance with each other. So if one of the hormones, or more than one hormones related to appetite or metabolic composition or metabolic activity are out, are out of whack, that has an impact on sex hormones as well. And it seems like vasomotor symptoms for once, so half flashes, night sweats, the hallmark of menopause, in this country uh, are, are more severe and more frequent with increasing body weight in women. And we're talking, of course, there's a whole range of body weight, but it's also important not to go underweight, right? But obesity has been linked with uh, more severe symptoms of menopause. However, there are clinical trials that looked at whether um, women who started out with a high body mass index or, you know, high body weight and lost a little bit of weight, a healthy amount of weight during the trial, they experienced, by means of lifestyle, exercise, healthy diet, they experienced an almost complete reduction in hot flashes in at least, I believe, it's as little as six months, even That's if it's amazing. a year. It's good for you overall, and that's a good added bonus, I think. Yeah, the, yes. we don't hear about that. We don't hear about that, which is really unfortunate. Diet and exercise have been shown many times to have an impact on, on women's experience of menopause yeah. in a good way. I have one more thing I, I just occurred to me about Japan. They don't, they come, the most common symptom of menopause is actually not even hot flashes for them, is a frozen shoulder. Yes, like pains and aches, and specifically frozen shoulder, which really, really suggests that yes, there's always a component, like a genetic component to most things, but the fact of visomotor symptoms are not actually the hallmark of menopause internationally, mm -hmm. suggests yeah. that there's a lifestyle component, that there's a medical health component, that there are things that you can do to minimize the symptoms that can be so disruptive for so many women, they can also, there's a connection between the intensity and severity of heart flashes and endothelial health, like your cardiovascular health may be compromised, especially if you start flushing at an early age, and especially for African-American and Hispanic women. So this is something to consider prevention, prevention, prevention. And they also seem to be associated with white matter lesions in the brain. So these are little bright spots that we see on MRI scans that we do all the time clinically and diagnostically that are a sign that the fat inside your brain that covers your neurons, the myelin sheet that covers the neurons is getting damaged. And you don't want that. It's a risk factor for vascular cognitive impairment later on in life. So this is also something to consider for prevention. Like there's, there, there are many reasons to yeah. not have severe half flashes. And there are many ways to mitigate that, whether by lifestyle interventions, medical adjustments, or even prescription therapies for, some, for whoever wants them, they're available. So it's something to consider. I'd rather, take, you know, I'd rather have a frozen shoulder, although it hurts a lot, <laughs> than... Yeah. yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting you to say that as the symptom. Yes, you know. No, which... and in India, in some rural Indian societies, where again they don't suffer as much as Western women do during menopause, the most common um, complaint during menopause is reduced eyesight. Mm. You don't see as well. Yeah. So there's got to be some cultural elements here. You know. You know, and just yeah. 
you know, just I, I'm just throwing stuff out here, but mm-hmm. you know, if we're thinking about the emotional component of physical symptoms, maybe mm-hmm. it's just the the weight of the on the shoulders of the Japanese women, for example, and that being released or transformed in some kind of way, or mm-hmm. you know, in India, maybe it's like. Uh, you know, not wanting to see certain things or gaining clarity. I don't know. <laughs> who but knows? Who knows? But... There's different things in the culture and yes. also things that are placed upon our psyche mm-hmm. and our culture. Oh, in, sure. the, in the United States, of course, like it's such an, a, a vast array of different things. You know, we were called a melting pot. And she's beautiful, which is beautiful, yeah. but uh, can also be messy. And can so messy. We're, we're in a place <laughs> of figuring things out right now. And I just want to be an advocate of this because what you're sharing, and I wish this was, this should be on the news every day because Mm. it gives us more legs, more under the belief that, okay, I want to make sure that I'm taking care of my, of my body and not allowing myself to getting, getting to a place where my metabolic health is really damaged or dangerous for me because of, instead of it just being from the perspective of vanity, which that has its place, Mm -hmm. but understanding like our, these our fat cells are producing yes. hormones as well. Yes. Right? In particular, yes. estrogen is mm-hmm. in the mix here. Our muscles are an endocrine organ. Like mm-hmm. all of these things are helping or potentially hurting how folks are going through menopause. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So now I want to circle back, okay. as mentioned, to the mindset piece and okay. how that can potentially influence how folks are going through this process. Mm-hmm. Or because any process in life. Any, yes, right? exactly, exactly. So something that I find helpful as a woman or when I talk to our patients or their families, I find husbands and friends are really always very interested in supporting other the women in their lives, which I think is beautiful. And like I was, tell, I was telling you, my daughter has eight, can explain this, and it has been explaining this to all her little friends, which is really funny. <laughs> But women's brains and bodies go through three major changes throughout the course of life, at least from a brain perspective, and they call them the three Ps. And then coming back to mindset, but let me tell you the three Ps. It's your puberty, pregnancy, and perimenopause, which is the transition to menopause. And what these three Ps have in common is that they are linked to a change in the neuroendocrine system that I mentioned before, where there's a specific thing that happens to your brain, which is that the brain rewires itself at all three Ps, and every time a woman is pregnant, that happens again. So there's a rewiring that takes place where, this may sound a little scary, but we actually shed neurons. We lose neurons. But then the neurons that we have that stay with us get more strongly interconnected and they seem to be very specifically, this happens very specifically in parts of the brain that are involved with theory of mind tasks, which is mentalizing, which is the ability to connect with another person intuitively and read another person's state of mind. Mm. And that is very important in puberty because that allows you as a teenager to become a member of society because you need to understand what people say and think in order to relate with them and be a member of a team, right? So what happens with the rewiring is that, yes, you do have the strong emotions and you have the risk-taking behavior because these parts of your brain are a little bit in a state of flux. But there's a good outcome at the end of it, which is that these changes that give you a hard time could be especially women as we start having our periods, right, and PMS and whatnot. But at the end of the process, you have a better brain, right, for what we need as a human species and race. Then it happens again during pregnancy. And this time, we have the baby blues, we have the postpartum depression, we have the brain fog, we have a lot of things that can happen when you're pregnant. But again, these changes lead to a brain, to a neurological system that is so on point that you're able to respond to your baby's needs instinctively, intuitively, is your intuition that is upregulated during pregnancy. It's the primitive parts of your brain that make you stronger, they make you more like always ready to get going, always ready to resolve an issue. 
and able to read another person's mental state. Again, it's serious mind. That kid can speak for a really long right. time. So you need to be able to read nonverbal clues. So all this baby blue is the mommy brain. We always blame the mommy brain as something that gives us a hard time that can be a bit of an issue. But in reality, there's a reason. You've been predisposed to motherhood. You're enabled to be a good mother and your brain is changing accordingly. Then we get to menopause. All the circuits that allow you to be a mother and hold a, host a pregnancy and respond to a pregnancy, those can go. You no longer need them. So all those neurons, this is my own personal theory, all those neurons can go. And that leads to the rewiring another time. Menopause is a renovation project on the brain. That comes with pros and cons and there's ups and downs. And that is the reality for any person who's born with ovaries. There's going to be ups and downs, weekly, monthly, for a really long time, and then the final one is menopause. But what the menopause brain gives you is peace of mind. And I'm coming back to the mindset. There's many studies, cultural studies, showing that menopause brings some gifts to women neurologically. One is greater life contentment. Many postmenopausal women report that once the transition is successfully complete, they are happier than many women who are younger and premenopausal, but they're also happier that they themselves were before menopause. And we never talk about it, we have to, because that really gives you something to look forward to, right? But also makes you feel better about going through this process. And number two, there's greater empathy. Studies have shown that postmenopausal women are the ultimate empaths. Like they have the highest scores and ratings of empathy across all people of all ages and genders. And the most important one, in my mind, is uh, emotional mastery, emotional control, where so many <laughs> women who are postmenopausal really report given fewer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in a good way, where they're just so much more self-confident about what they bring to the table, what they have accomplished, what they can accomplish, and they start looking forward to things much more so than before. And what's interesting for me as a neuroscientist is that there is a neurological correlate to that. So when you do the brain scans, you can see that after menopause, there's one specific part of the brain, it's called the amygdala, that does no longer overactivate in response to negative things that happen to you. Mm. So you're still responding to good things, but your response to things that would have been upsetting is actually more blunted. You don't care that much. You're like, yeah, whatever, been there, done that. You know, I'm not going to let it go under my skin. But your frontal cortex, which is in charge of reasoning and thinking, works just as well as before. And so overall, there's a better control over your own emotions and the greatest stability in your emotional reactions, which I think is a big plus. People would want to pay yes. for that. Right? You know? Yes. But we don't hear about, like, that's one of the yeah. benefits that comes along with this process. Yes. You know? And you just shared, it's so beautiful how those things go, go together. Yeah. Um, being more, having a high level of empathy, but mm -hmm. at the same time, giving fewer <laughs> yes. So it's like giving fewer <laughs> about the negativity the and negative drama, things, all the stuff, or, yes, but caring deeply matter. about the things that you yes. care about, right? It's, that's yes. like, that's, that's, that's the recipe, that's the recipe for happiness and contentment and yes. like a overriding, like continuous feeling of well-being, mm -hmm. I really feel mentally. Yeah. But like I said, people would gladly pay for that <laughs> state today because yes. we tend to, especially today, there's so many things to give a fuck about, <laughs> right? There's yes. just so much going on in the world. And oftentimes what we see today of, you know, a lot of times we lose ourselves in those things yeah. and we're not able to properly distribute our compassion and empathy mm -hmm. to the things that matter most. We find ourselves feeling fractured. And so hearing that this is a, a one of the benefits, again, it's like giving more legs to the belief of why this should be something that's honored and valued. Yes. Like it is in other cultures. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, I agree so much. So could you share a little bit more about 
here in particular in the Western world, mm -hmm. reframing our mindset yes. about this? Yes. Okay. I well, we have to. So I think in society, in our society, menopause is typically met with stigma and with bias. It's a combination, it's a convergence of ageism and sexism that really end up with menopauseism, mm. where menopausal women are basically made invisible in culture and they're completely ignored in medicine and in science. We have a very long history of neglecting women in science and medicine, and that is never truer than after menopause. That the vast majority of what's been done focusing on women is about reproduction and just being able to have a kid, right? But everything else is kind of up for grabs. And I think especially when it comes to menopause, the research has been scarce, to put it gently. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to, to help in that respect because it makes no sense that the women who reach menopause, which is most women, God willing, right? If you live long enough as a woman, eventually you will go through menopause. And there's no sense of achievement. There's no sense of having accomplished something wonderful. There's nothing to look forward to, according to Western medicine. And there's no status gained. And that is unacceptable. Unacceptable. I really... I call this book is, is my love letter to womanhood. I think being a woman is just so beautiful and there's so much to celebrate. And I would really like all women to embrace this phase of life and, and celebrate what it brings. And also be mindful that there are symptoms, there are risks, they need attending for many women. They need managing. Um, not for all women, you know, it's a personal choice. It's a free, it's a free country, of course. But if you do have a problem, it's important to know that there are solutions that can be custom tailored to your personality and your own needs. And there are many people like myself who are more than happy to help. And it's important to know that the support is there. So with your new book, you talk mm -hmm. about a wide range. Of course, you get yes. every, everything that we're covering right now, just getting into the science and what's happening mm -hmm. to get educated on what's happening in your own body, but also talking about some of the supportive aspects with this transit transition. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about a, a few of the lifestyle yeah, factors, great. but in particular, you also talk about hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, And obviously there's a lot of misconceptions about hormone replacement therapy. Yes. And... If you could, can you share where that would fit in and mm -hmm. how that works in the context of the menopause brain? Yes. Uh, so it is a complicated conversation. So you stop me when it's too much. Okay. So hormone replacement therapy was the treatment of choice for menopause up until the year 2002. So estrogen as a hormone was discovered in 1936. And immediately, almost immediately, people linked it with sexuality and reproduction. So it's been dubbed a sex hormone since, which is really unfortunate. We've been stuck with that definition ever since. And it's been marketed for menopause care ever since, right? But it was also the number one drug, the most sold medication in the United States. Yes, yes, for many, many years until 2002. So what happened at that point? Two things happened. Number one, 1992, scientists finally discovered that the same hormones that are so important for reproduction are also just as important for brain health. So estrogen is not just a sex hormone. It serves so many roles and functionalities that have nothing to do with kids and have everything to do with having a healthy brain. That was only accepted in science in 1996 for context. When do we get to the moon? <laughs> right? Like Max said the other day, he said, well, we know more about space than about women's health and hormones, right? And yeah, that's, that's actually still true, sadly. But so 1996, at that point, the largest clinical trial in history testing hormone therapy for women health. women's health was already underway. It launched in 1993. This is the Women's Health Initiative. 
So it launched years before anyone had any clue how estrogen actually have worked in our brains for sure, but also in the rest of the body, except your ovaries. So that is a problem, as you can imagine. And so this hormone was being tested in a study of hundreds of thousands of women all over the United States. And it was being tested. So estrogen replacement therapy is, uh, there are two ways of doing it. You have estrogen-only therapy for women who do not have a uterus, and estrogen and progesterone, or progestogen, for women with a uterus. Now, how many people do you think do not have a uterus in the United States? Let me see if this is common knowledge or not. Do you want me to throw an actual number out or percentage? Do you know what, well, no, but, but, brother, but do you know it's a common surgery? It is increasingly common. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the second most common surgery for women in the United States. So it's not like a couple of women, right? right? It's a lot. It's one in eight. That is a. I mean, it's again, more than very substantial. Yes. What, what people would casually think, yeah. Yes. So it's a lot more women than one would think. So this is relevant, and not just three listeners who are going to <laughs> <laughs> be like, "Oh, that's interesting." No, it, it happens a lot. So if you have a uterus, you have to take a progesterone because estrogen alone increases the risk of endometrial cancer. So if you take the progesterone together with it, the risk goes back down to baseline. So they had these two arms, one per treatment, and both arms were interrupted early because therapy was doing exactly the opposite of what was intended to be. There was a higher risk of stroke. There was higher risk of blood clots. There was a higher incidence of cardiovascular events. There was also higher risk of breast cancer and the higher risk of dementia. So pretty much that was it. The media overemphasized the numbers, and we're going to talk about it. But what happened is that most women just stopped treatment. The trials were halted midway. Women just dropped their hormones. And hormone replacement therapy has had a terrible reputation since. So now we know more, we know better. I think with what everybody agrees on is that the Women's Health Initiative was looking at the wrong women. Yes, I know, you're like, why? Because they only had eight years, 10 years to finish the trial. And cardiovascular accidents happen when you're a little bit older and dementia happens when you're 70 or 80. So I can't look at women who are in their 40s and 50s. I need to look at women who are in their 70s and 80s or I won't catch anyone who develops these outcomes. So they were working with women who were decades postmenopausal. And if you remember, this system is only active for a certain amount of time and then it just turns off. So if you want to give hormones, you need to do it while the system is receptive to the hormones. You can't just re into you can't push hormones on something that doesn't want them. Mm -hmm. So that was the big problem. Now we understand a lot more. There's a lot of research that has been done. And professional societies issued revised guidelines in 2022, thank goodness, updated guidelines, saying that for women who had a hysterectomy, surgical removal of the ovaries, estrogen therapy, estrogen only, Therapy is actually recommended to reduce vasomotor symptoms, the symptoms of menopause, but also to reduce the risk of things like osteoporosis later in life, to reduce the risk of mood disorders, to, to reduce the risk of depressive symptoms and anxiety, but also potentially reduce the risk of cognitive impairment and cognitive issues, which are quite common. It could be, it could be really a problem because we know that the risk of dementia is higher for women who go through menopause because of surgical interventions relative to women who go through menopause spontaneously. So I don't want to scare anyone, but it, it's just a relative increase in risk. We don't the risk know is this. a little bit I know. Still, one in eight women. One in eight women and, and we don't know. They're not talk getting this it. information usually no. when they're going through this process. Yeah, you know what was shocking to me speaking of this is Hysterectomy, the, the surgical removal of the uterus, can be partial or full. Partial, only the uterus comes out. Full, the ovaries come, come out too. Whether or not this happens should be based on whether or not the ovaries need taken out. Yeah. It's not the case. Yep. 
So still today, when you go to the doctor as a woman and you have a uterus, it's very common for the surgeons to recommend that the ovaries will come out as well. Let's do a, let's take the, the, do you want to have kids? No? Yeah, well, you Are you maybe in your 40s now? Then no? you don't need them. Then you don't need them. Yeah. And if I take them out now, then your risk of ovarian cancer later on in life is zero. <laughs> right? So if you're a surgeon, that makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. The problem is that how about their brains? If you have no reason to take out healthy ovaries, now most societies recommend ovarian preservation. You leave them in. But still today, about over 40% of women who get a hysterectomy for whatever reason, but their ovaries are healthy, they still have an oophorectomy at the same time. So this is something important to discuss with your surgeon if it ever comes to that. There are cases where you do need to take them out. That there's, you know, otherwise the risk of having to redo the surgery is higher, or there's reasons to, to take the ovaries out even if there's no cancer, there are other indications. But for most women, ovarian preservation is in fact recommended. Yeah, but just to do it on the, you don't need them, is that not is a good not enough re reason. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it may not be correct. Yeah. I'm going to scratch that. That's not true. It's really case by case. But there is, for many years, best practice was to take them out. Mm -hmm. So the surgeons were just following guidelines. And the point is that the guidelines need updating. Yeah. Because they're not up to speed with reality. You've shared several times the impact of these hormones on the brain and this powerful interaction. You know, you even mentioned bone density yes. as well, being yes. another one of these roles. So estrogen plays a huge role in cognitive function, brain health, huge. and we've got to keep this in consideration when we're yeah. making choices about our bodies and our health. Mm -hmm. And if you could, can you talk a little bit about what are the best practices when it comes to hormone replacement therapy? Uh, yes. Well, so what's interesting and what's important to understand is that not all hormones are created equal. So when we talk about estrogen, we're actually already talking about three different types of estrogen. So estrogen is an umbrella term for different types of estrogens. And the one we want to replace is called estradiol. So estradiol is the most potent, is the most bio biologically active hormone during a woman's reproductive life. Mm -hmm. And then we have estrion that is only made during pregnancy. And then we have estrone, which is plan B in a way. So that becomes the most common, most abundant type of estrogen after menopause. But it doesn't come only from the ovaries. It's also made by body fat and other tissues. And the hormone that we're trying to replace or supplement is estradiol. Now, there are two major types of hormones that have been used clinically for menopause. Um, what was used in the Women's Health Initiative is called a CEE, a conjugated equine estrogen. And what we use more now is called micronized estradiol or bioidentical estradiol. Then you can administer these hormones in different ways. Usually it's either oral, you take a pill, or transdermal, a patch, or a spray or a gel, and vaginally as well. It can also be done intramuscularly, but the most common route is now transdermal through the skin, so you have a patch or a spray. Actually, my mentor loves a spray. She recommends it. And she's, she's one of the leaders in estrogen, everything um, in science. Then if you have a uterus, you want to add the progesterone on top. And it's important to understand, this comes up a lot and you'll find it on social media. So I want to clarify, all these hormones can be bioidentical or not. Okay, progesterone means bioidentical progesterone or micronized progesterone. It looks exactly, it's a molecular replica of the hormone that we make from the ovaries. But there are other forms that are called synthetic progestogens or progestins, and there are many different types. We have them in birth control, we have them in HRT or MHT for menopause. Usually progesterone uh, is being given orally, it's a pill you take by mouth. You can do it either continuously throughout the menstrual cycle, one pill per day or sort of, 
or uh, cyclically. So you only take it towards the end of the cycle or, you know, what would be your cycle. Best way to use hormones. If you have symptoms of menopause to ease you through the transition. This is common. These are accepted guidelines. These are the indications that the FDA approved. So you take these hormones for relief of hot flashes and night sweats and for prevention of osteoporosis for women who don't yet have osteoporosis and then for treatment of um, urinary, genital urinary symptoms which are vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, painful intercourse, urinary tract infections and a lot of other things that are more topical. Okay, so in that case, a lotion is great. There is vaginal estrogen. Did I want to just clarify this thing? A lot of women are scared about the possible link with cancer, breast cancer. There is no evidence the vaginal estrogen, topical estrogen, causes breast cancer. So this is very important to understand because vaginal atrophy is a hack of an unpleasant symptom for which there are solutions that are safe and available for the vast majority of women. Contraindications are very rare. They can be started anytime. You can do it daily. There's, there's not been evidence, there, has, there is no evidence that that would increase the risk of breast cancer. But if you buy them, there's the black box warning that has nothing to do with what's in the box. It still refers to the oral conjugated equine estrogens given at very high doses during the Women's Health Initiative. So that's one reason that a lot of women say, no, thank you. And that's not right. It's not the right information that we should be given. And so the approach here is more perimenopause versus premenopause not premenopause you have to yes you have to have the symptoms because so there are some th you know camps of thought of uh, I see. right <laughs> yes yes well you have to go through the fda so the indications are for symptoms of menopause mm -hmm. if you have the symptoms when you're premenopausal then i think we need to dig a little bit deeper and see what's happening is your thyroid is it pcos is it something else but generally, perimenopause is a good time to start or early after the final menstrual period, as long as you have symptoms. Yeah. You know, there are some women who have symptoms still in the 70s. So now there's a movement to say, well, you know what? Let's start at very, very low doses and see if that helps. If it does, it means that your system is still active and still receptive to the estrogens. And maybe that helps. Let's you know, let's make sure that you get mammograms and this and that. But it is it is on the table. I think it's it's helpful to know that it is on the table. Yeah. Also, if you're a little bit older. And also, the other thing that changed in 2022 is that up until then, the recommendation was to stay on the lowest possible dose of hormone, if you must, almost do it, if you really can't avoid it, and go off as soon as you can. And now the guidelines have changed to say you do not need to stop just because you've reached a certain age, if you feel that you still have a benefit, you keep taking it. Just make sure that you monitor, that you go for your checkups, that you work with a professional, that you've been followed. And, you know, it's no longer considered unsafe. Yeah. And of course, reading your book and getting more information on this. Yes. I love that you mentioned this, having this on the table. Yeah. It's and, on the table. you know, these are options for folks but there are some things that are kind of like across the board that you recommend yeah. for, a, for a more graceful transition. Yes. And I want to talk about a couple of these. Okay. We're going to talk about some of them that are a little bit more common knowledge in just a moment. Okay. But I want to start off by one that I was surprised that you talked about, which mm. is toxins. Toxins. You're surprised. Yes. Well, not not really. Not really. <laughs> but surprised that, you know, this was something that you made a, an emphasis to, you know, yes. to, to be aware of for people. I think it's really important. We know that there are chemical compounds that are constantly released into our environment that have consequences for hormonal health. And years ago, many people were skeptic 
about it, but I think at this point we have enough scientific evidence that pollutants do matter, and they may have their very specific pollutants or chemical toxins that are called endocrine disruptors or xenoestrogens, foreign estrogens from Greek, because they do disrupt the functionality of estrogen. They mimic estrogen, so they, they work like an estrogen. They bind to the same receptors, but the consequences are actually deleterious. They're, they're harmful. And that is especially the case for, they've been linked with a number of conditions from thyroid disease to infertility, to endometriosis, to some types of cancer. And now, because of the association with menopause, also to a possibly higher risk of dementia. Down the line, like uh, just a couple of years ago, the scientific community finally endorsed pollution, primarily air pollution, but pollution as a whole is a risk factor for dementia. Hmm. Yes, that's quite new in my field. So we, we do sometimes recommend air purifiers when indicated of course it's an expense but if you live in a very polluted very polluted environment that's something to look into and all these issues are more of a problem of course for children and women in particular why for a couple of reasons uh, the most important being that pollutants accumulate in living tissues by bioaccumulation which means that they pile up on top of each other. So they don't, they're very, they have a very long half-life. They stay in your body for a really, really long time. And so they, they just keep increasing over time. They accumulate in bodily tissues, especially fat. And women are born with a higher percentage of fat, fatty tissue relative to men. So we have more fat in our bodies by design. We have, you know, for getting pregnant and then going through menopause, you need to have more fat to do it efficiently as a body, but that also means that you're more vulnerable to the effects of these pollutants that accumulate in body fat and stay there for a really Lipoph long time. Lipophilic. They're very highly lipophilic. You know, these tracers that we use, mm -hmm. they're all very highly lipophilic, which means they get inside your brain. The brain is mm -hmm. mostly lipids. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anything that is lipophilic will just go right through your membranes Sometimes, it depends on how strong your blood-brain barrier is, but it can get more easily inside your brain and then just stick in your brain, which nobody needs. So, Can I ask you about it. this? There's, yeah. uh, there's some theories out there that the blood-brain barrier doesn't even exist. All right? I don't know if you've been exposed to this, but there's some people out there on the streets. Exposed. There's flat earthers. We got blood-brain barrier <laughs> doesn't existers. That's interesting. You, you haven't heard this before? I wish it didn't exist in some ways because it's so hard for us to find tracers that can get inside your brain. Mm -hmm. They cannot. Most tracers that we use for brain imaging um, fail before we can use them for clinical applications because they can't get inside your brain. And the reason they can't is that we do have a blood brain barrier. It's very highly selective. I don't know why they're saying that it doesn't exist. Maybe it's the terminology then or they're just saying there is no such structure. Yes. Mm. So, well, the thing is, it isn't just one structure. Ah, okay. Can so you talk a, a little bit about it from your perspective about how it works? Well, so like it, it's the an umbrella term, again, for a very intricate system that protects your brain from everything that is non-brain. So there are many different layers of protection that are in place. They start from the outside, obviously, the skull is there to protect your brain. And then you have cerebrospinal fluid that protects your brain. But also you do have a sort of barrier system. I don't know, maybe the term is not appealing because it's too simple. Mm -hmm. Blood brain, it looks like they're just one thin layer or something. Whereas it's a very intricate system that is not necessarily anatomically defined. So it's not like a little layer or something, but it's more a structure that we define as a barrier. Like you can think about this as like the coral reef has a barrier, right? But it's not a, a piece of rock. There's all different corals and there's this and there's that. And the same happens inside the brain. So it's actually a very intricate system that can be subcategorized into many different components. There's receptors, there's all sorts of different receptors. There is 
um, ways by which things can get through. Then there's blood vessels, there's endothelial tissue, this is a whole number of things. So I agree that it's very heterogeneous. Yeah, because I think we it's, perceive it as like there's a, a barrier at your neck. No, 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 no. That stops, a, you know what I mean? No, um, for, no, for some no. people, but it's like it's more of a global brain system. There's even unique to to your neurons. There's a there's, yes, yes. You yes. said this it's the powerful outer statement. surface of your brain, basically, also on the inside out. So it's whatever shields your brain from the cerebrospinal fluid is the barrier. It is not necessarily just blood. Mm -hmm. So I see where where the terminology maybe is not as. Convincing, but th there is a barrier. When it's healthy and, and strong and compact, that's wonderful because it's very protective, but it does get damaged, you know, with aging, with disease, with insults, with, with oxidative stress, with inflammation. Toxin exposure. Toxin exposure. Yeah. And then it, it basically things can go through that should not go through. And pollutants are one of those. So it's really important to to consider that. And when we when we say pollutants, it's not just a like, tobacco smoke or a cigarette smoke it's it's a lot of chemicals that we find in the food that we eat or in the household products that we use or you know flame retardants or specific types of fabric anything synthetic mm -hmm. has the potential for containing some of these endocrine disruptors or estrogen disrupting chemicals according to the epa mm -hmm. over three billion tons of yeah newly invented synthetic chemicals are released into our environment annually and this is from what they refer to as normal business practices <laughs> right so this isn't when like a catastrophic event happens or anything it's just yeah. normal day-to-day -day pollution, pr pr pollution. Mm. and so you know we're living in a very different environment and one of those things you know just that so many of us are exposed to when you mentioned xenoestrogen i was thinking mm -hmm. about what is the common thing that would be in our food supply and that would be pesticides yes so a lot of these have these estrogenic effects and as a matter of fact clopyrifos is one of these pesticides that's caught up in red tape right now mm. but several studies have indicated increased miscarriages, miscarriages infertility yes. all these different issues mm -hmm. and for for women that are exposed to these compounds and it's just because, again, if you think about it, it's because of the estrogen-like mm -hmm. impact that it has on the yes. body. And, you know, I think an important thing that we can do in these diet guidelines, whatever diet we're subscribed to, is if we can avoid some of these toxins, yes. you know, that's, you, you that's know, the way to go about it. You can be on any diet and, you know, it can be vegan, you can be vegetarian, it can be keto and still eat processed foods. Yeah. They... They really make them for you, right? Oh, you're plant-based. Great. Let me give you the plant-based version of so-and-so that is loaded with chemicals and is not a healthy food just because it comes from plants mm -hmm. and the other way around. So I think it's important for diets to really go for whole foods whenever possible, organic when possible. With, you know, within reason, there are things that are not sprayed as much with pesticides, but we know which are. So those maybe you want to, at least you want to peel them at the minimum, right? That helps a little bit. But also animals, you know, when they consume things that contain pesticides and other chemicals, then by bioaccumulation, they end up in the meat. And, and also milk, what and are they being the, fed the as well? There's yeah, been issues the microplastics with, the with hormones. Yes. And with you know um, antibiotics and things like that like you are what you eat ate yes as well you know? so keeping that in mind <laughs> one of the most powerful things that you've said today which is so many incredible things you said the brain calls for nutrients yes we can't push them in there we cannot push them in the brain is a very interesting or there are a few things that get through by passive diffusion in the brain like glucose up to a certain point but most nutrients are, is the brain that calls for them. It's like the brain has these receptors and these uh, passageways in the blood brain barrier that we are trying to define as existing um, that very selectively can choose when is the right time to let nutrients in. 
And this is something that I described in Brain Food, which is my first book, which is actually how we met a long time ago, it was 2018. And one reason that I wrote Brain Food is that back then there was a little bit of a trend outside of academia to promote very high fat diets for brain health based on the statement that the brain is made mostly of fat and so you have to replenish those fats. And if you look at the fat composition of the brain, there is quite a bit of cholesterol. And so there were quite a few people, doctors included, even neurologists on social media, saying you have to eat cholesterol-rich foods because the cholesterol will go up in your brain and replenish it. And say, like, absolutely not. Cholesterol cannot get inside your brain ever. Do, do you know? So of course, the, your, the, brain, right. your brain makes the cholesterol. Your brain makes its own yeah. cholesterol when you're born, actually even before you're born, and then it's completely shielded from the rest of the body. So some cholesterol can come out of your brain, but it just cannot get in. And the brain is also really selective, let me tell you, when it comes to fat, because we try to get things through by using fatty yeah. molecules, right? And we just can't. So saturated fat can barely get inside the brain more so Past in infancy. kids yeah there we go yes of course of course i've read your book <laughs> yes but then it's quite difficult like if you look at the uptake curves they're, they're nearly flat depending on on what time we're looking you know what we're looking at but then polyunsaturated fatty acids can get through so that's the only kind of fact that the brain actually really calls for often and those are fats that we want to have in the diets, the, the omega-3. Omegas and, are super important for yeah. the brain. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you share a wide variety of different foods and nutrient yes. sources that support the menopause brain. Yeah. Can you talk about a few, maybe less, there's, again, there's so many in the book, but maybe like three things that are just kind of across the board and important for women's yes. brains. So I would say number one is up your plant game. You have to eat more plants. That seems to be the one thing that, that really comes through across all different studies, that plants are the name of the game. Fiber is so important for women's health and menopause, and so are antioxidants. And I'm not trying to push veganism or vegetarianism on, on anyone. It's just a matter of prioritizing eating fresh produce because of the nutrients that are provided by plants. So fiber, of course, is extremely important, but not just for digestion. It's also important for estrogen regulation because fiber has a balancing effect on a molecule that's called sex hormone binding globulin that carries your hormones around. So it's the kind of molecule that determines what fraction of estrogen and testosterone are still in the circulation. And if you want this, this molecule to be working efficiently, and eating fiber seems to have a positive modulatory effect on this protein. So it also helps with regulating hormones. Number two, antioxidants. Antioxidants come from plant-based foods. Veggies, fruits, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, mostly veggies and fruit, some more than others. So um, the best antioxidants for the brain, as far as we know, are beta-carotene, the precursor to vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and selenium as a mineral. So you want to make sure that you have foods in your diet that do provide these nutrients, and some that I really like, at least, are berries, all sorts of berries, blackberries more so than others. Goji berries are one of the richest sources of vitamin C, readily available per unit, so you just need a little handful. You know, prunes! Are really good too. They're very high in antioxidants and fiber, soluble fiber, so they support a little bit across the board. Dates, medjool dates are really good, complex carbs. Um, but those all sort of leafy green veggies and cruciferous vegetables, you know, the more the merrier. The more you can eat, the better for you. And then the last thing I would like to say is um, the astrobalum. Can we talk about it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, Everybody knows that we have a microbiome in our guts that is involved in a number of functionalities, including reducing inflammation, digesting food, extracting nutrients, and also balancing out your mood. 
it seems to have a strong connection with the GABA receptor in the brain, which is an inhibitory receptor and neurotransmitter that promotes calm and reduces anxiety. But what is less known is that the microbiome is very heterogeneous, includes all sorts of uh, things and good microbes and bad microbes. The good microbes have little families, and one of these little families is called the astrobolome, which is a part of the microbiome that has a strong impact. Potentially, it's been investigated as having a strong balancing impact on estrogen levels and also on glucose metabolism at the same time. So there's one specific enzyme, it's called beta-GUS, beta-GAS, that is part of this estrobolum and regulates the amount of free estrogen that is in your bloodstream at all times. It kind of regulates whether or not estrogen has been reutilized or eliminated. So it's important for biodistribution. And the way that you keep your strobolum healthy and happy is by eating plant-based foods, whole foods mm-hmm. of plant-based origin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's providing these inputs for our microbes, supporting that yes. diversity is the hallmark. Diversity right? is key, yeah. Um, because these different microbial communities need different inputs. Yes. And so that's the number one thing seen in the data to improve the health of your microbiome, Mm -hmm. increase the diversity of plant inputs. Yes. And in particular, you know, polyphenols and antioxidants and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, and again, you share some specifics and also you share some particular supplements and other lifestyle factors that, again, everybody should know this stuff. The Menopause Brain is the new book. And so I want everybody to run out, pre-order this book right now, or depending on when you're listening to this episode, because the book officially releases... March 12th. March 12th. And here's something really special. Of course, I got an advanced copy of the book. And I feel, seriously, this should be required reading, not just for women, but for all of us, because this is impacting our society. And Mm -hmm. nobody's talking about this. Mm -mm. And... This is so important in the consolidation of the data. You make everything make sense. And there's so many incredible, simple resources, simple things to think about. I love how this conversation, you integrated the mindset piece as well, because it's so unfortunately looked over in our Mm -hmm. culture and how our thoughts and our beliefs impact our health outcomes. So it's a really, really special book, The Menopause Brain, pre-order copy right now. You can, of course, get it at any of your online retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all that good stuff, but also themenopausebrain.com. Yes. People can go there. And also, I'm sure you're going to give them some bonuses and other goodies. Yes. So support this book. Be one of the first people to get it. The Menopause Brain, very, very important book. Get it for people that you care about. Yes, mom. Any women in your yes. life, get this book for them and be another resource and another support. You're the best. Is there anything else you want to share about this book? I would like to say one thing, that so many women are really scared of losing their minds during menopause. It happens so often, which is why the first chapter is called You Are Not Crazy. And I really want to reassure most women that you are not losing your mind as you go through menopause. In fact, if science is any indication, you're getting a brand new one. And it's interesting and it's worth knowing and embracing because it happens whether you want it or not. And we all need to think of menopause after years and years of having a menstrual cycle and PMS and pregnancies and postpartum, whatever happened. Eh? Menopause is another tune that we learn to dance to. We can do it, we have support. We have the knowledge, we have the information. It's time to act on it. The Menopause Brain, Dr. Lisa Moscone, everybody. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. It's been information withheld from us for a very long time, and it is behind so much frustration, misunderstandings, and the orgasm gap, which is a, it's a big abyss that like not even the world's like greatest daredevil could jump it.